Hello everybody, my name is Michele Di Pietro. I am the Executive Director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Kennesaw State University, where I work with faculty and graduate students to help them um, refine their teaching. I'm also an Associate Professor in the Department of Statistics, where I teach a variety of graduate and undergraduate courses. But my real passion is actually learning. I'm fascinated by how people learn, and that is why I have devoted a significant chunk of my career to um, researching the learning process. And when I was at Carnegie Mellon with my colleagues there, we authored a book called How Learning Works, Seven Research-Based Principles for Smart Teaching, where we actually um, synthesized the literature 50 plus years of research into learning from a variety of perspectives, cognitive, motivational, developmental, uh, from diversity and inclusion, um, from organizational learning, into seven interrelated principles um, that explain what matters when students are trying to learn something, what determines how deep they will be able to go into that um, learning process. So one of them really has to do with um, what Derek was talking about, misconceptions. So we've seen a story about misconceptions in math, but actually misconceptions abound in every field. They were first documented in physics, but ever since then we have a strong catalog. So for instance, we have misconceptions in astronomy, where some students believe that the seasons are caused by the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the Sun. We see misconceptions in geology when some students say that they believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. We see misconceptions in statistics. I see this all the time when students behave as if association implies causation. They might even be able to tell me that association does not imply causation, but then they reason as if it did. Um, and then we see a lot of misconceptions in physics about velocity and acceleration, electricity, um, and many more phenomena, natural phenomena. We see misconceptions in neuroscience about the brain. For instance, the idea that uh, the left brain is more linear and the right brain is more creative. So uh, just take a second, if you will, to think about what is one typical misconception that students might have about a topic that you teach in your discipline. So there is a catalog of misconceptions, but they're not all the same. They vary in terms of how easier they are to address, to dispel. And so this is a somewhat of a taxonomy adopted from some researchers. So we see that misconceptions can be very easy to address when they are at the single proposition level, and they become progressively harder when they affect our whole mental model and beliefs that we have about how the world works. So let's attack them one by one. So at the very uh, basic level, we have proposition level misconceptions. So for instance, the idea that we only use 10% of our brain. That is actually not true. It's a very seductive idea. There's a lot of movies made about people somehow figuring out how to use all of their brain and then they acquire superpowers, they're invincible. Um, that's actually not true. This is a very easy misconception to address because it's not tied to other things. It's something that people have heard, but when you explain where that number comes from, that it's actually 10% is the um, gray matter in the brain and 90% is the white matter, but it's not like we don't use the white matter or that it's just um, unhelpful, then that makes sense to people and uh, they can readily replace this new explanation with the old one. Things get a little more complicated when we go to other levels. So, for instance, when we're asking students to replace a mental model that they have, which is flawed, with uh, a better one, a more useful one. So let's think about um, a model for blood circulation. Some students have a misconception that there is a single loop where all the blood travels from the heart to the rest of the body and then it comes back to the heart. This model is predicated on the belief that the heart oxygenates the body. 
Now we know that that is not true. We know that there is a double loop. The, the heart pumps the blood into the body, comes back to the heart, and it gets sent to the lungs, where it reoxygenates and comes back to the heart to start the cycle again. This is a little challenging because the model that students have is actually coherent. And when you mention lungs, um, students can treat that as just one more part of the body where the blood needs to uh, be sent to by the heart and not as a special uh, organ with a special function in that uh, process. So what we know about these kinds of misconceptions at this point is that they function first by accommodation. So students figure out early on that they have to accommodate, they, they have to include um, lungs when they talk about circulation to appease the professor, even though they don't really see what's so special about the lungs. And then only later on, if we force them to reason on the basis of their mental model. So if the function of the heart is to oxygenate the blood, where does oxygen come from? It comes from the air. We breathe it in. And so how does the oxygen get from the mouth and the nose to the heart? Now the model starts cracking because we don't see a, a clear connection immediately. It goes to the lungs from the mouth and the nose. Oh, so now you start seeing what's the special function of the lungs. So the strategy that we have found from the research is that in order to um, challenge existing flawed existing mental models, we need to make students reason on the basis of their models until they arrive to some kind of contradiction. And then they're ready to uh, listen and adopt, to a new, uh, adopt a new model. Some other misconceptions are because, happen because of miscategorization. So here's one example. And in fact, take a second to answer this question for yourself. This is an electric circuit with some light bulbs along the way. Uh, notice that the circuit is closed. And so the light bulbs will be um, lit. So, but the question is, what happens when we close that extra switch S to the light bulb C. Does, it, uh, does the intensity of that light bulb increase, decrease, or stay the same? So the answer is that it stays the same. But some students have the misconception that once you close that switch, uh, half of the electricity will go down that line and leaving only half uh, on the other side to go to C. Why does that happen? What researchers have figured out is that this happens because students are thinking of electricity as a substance, specifically water or a fluid. That is what would happen if this was a pipe with actual liquid in it. Half of the liquid would go down uh, as when, when, that, when that part was closed. Um, that is not what happens with electricity because electricity does not behave like water. So the first step to start addressing these misconceptions is to tell students, I think you're thinking of this as a fluid, but electricity is actually not a substance, but a process. It's about electrons bumping into each other. And so it won't solve everything, but it is a necessary first step to shift the categorization from uh, the erroneous one that it's actually impeding them in their reasoning to a better one. And then we get to embedded beliefs, like the idea that we've seen that um, the Earth is 6,000 years old. Those are the hardest to eradicate. And in fact, uh, we don't really have uh, magic bullets for those. They're problematic because they're tied to other beliefs. If you start challenging that, what else do you have to challenge? There is a, so there's a mental domino effect that goes on, uh, including the trust that you have in the people who told you that, um, that the Earth is 6,000 years old. Uh, and some students might not be ready to uh, engage in that process at this point. So this would be the hardest of all the misconceptions. Now, we talked about prior knowledge that students have that is actually um, 
inaccurate. But students have a lot of higher knowledge that is actually accurate. So let's think about how we can use that knowledge um, for as the foundation, as the building blocks for further learning. So it might not be ready as is. We might need to be adapted and co-opted. So in a, for instance, in a mathematics class or statistics, students might be familiar with some concept, but not recognize them immediately because the notation that they've seen in different classes where they first learned them is different. So that's an easy case of just making sure everybody's on the same page in terms of the language. Or sometimes students might have a little bit of prior knowledge, but it's not enough for the whole problem but it can certainly be capitalized. So for instance, when I start talking about hypothesis testing, I know that hopefully I can rely on knowledge that students have about measures of center and measures of variability, that they have a sense of means and standard deviations. And they could use that knowledge maybe to start thinking about differences in distributions, uh, differences between two groups, um, and how big these differences are relative to the variability of the distribution. They might not be able to arrive to the whole concept of hypothesis testing on their own, but that's a knowledge that exists there that can be um, certainly incorporated. Unfortunately, there's a step that needs to happen first. And we'll see that with this example. This is actually one of the most replicated um, experiments in psychology. So each card has two uh, sides with letters and numbers on both sides, and we only get to see one side. And we, but we know that if we see a vowel, if, I'm sorry, we know that if we see a letter on one side, then there should be a number on the other side and uh, vice versa. And there is a rule in this situation. The rule is that if a card has a vowel on one side, it should have an even number on the other side. Now, we're concerned that some cards might be breaking this rule. And so we want to uh, check. We want to turn them over to see if they're following the rule. We also want to be efficient, and we don't want to turn over cards that we don't need to. So the question is, what is the minimum number of cards that we must turn over to verify whether the rule is being followed or not? And so there's four options there, A, A and 6, A and 7, A, 6, M and 7. So take a second to think about this. So the answer is A and 7. A is a problem because if it has um, if it has an even number on the other side, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in violation. Seven is in violation if it has a vowel on the other side. Now, some people get confused and think that six might be a problem, but if six has a vowel on the other side, uh, it's fine. And if six has a consonant on the other side, there's no rule about consonants, so six is fine. For the same reason that there's no rule about consonants, M is also fine and we don't need to check that. This is a hard problem. When I do this in groups with uh, professors, people with terminal degrees, um, they struggle to come to consensus on this and it takes them actually significant time. Um, but I am a big believer in uh, redemption and second chances, so I usually give them a second problem to work on to see how they do on that one. So let's look at the second problem. We still have cards with um, things on both sides, except in this case, these cards in this green problem are stand-ins for students, for people. And on one side, we have their age, and on the other side, we have the drink that they're drinking. And there is a rule in this situation. The rule is if that they're drinking alcohol, they must be over 21. Again, we're concerned that some students are violating the rule. And so we want to ID them. And we also want to be efficient. So what is the minimum number of students that we must ID to verify that the rule is being followed and which ones? Now, this is a much easier problem. 
most people can easily immediately see that we are concerned about the minor, 16, and the person is drinking alcohol to check whether they are at least 21. And so people do much better on this problem than on the other problem. But if you think about it, these two problems are very similar. They're not identical, but they are isomorphic. There is a mapping between letters and numbers, vowels and consonants and odd and even numbers, and age and drinks, and age above and below 21, and alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks. And the rule also matches. So because they're isomorphic, what that means is that the mental operations required to solve the problems are the same. So how can it be that one is um, much easier than the other, takes less time, and uh, most people agree on the solution? Um, people have different explanations for that, but one of the interesting explanations is that we are very familiar with the rule of uh, the drinking rules, in the US at least. We use them all the time. They affect us, they may, maybe they affect our kids, maybe they affect our students if we're shop running an event, maybe we've tended bar at some point and we had to um, pay attention to these facts. The other problem is abstract and does not rely on that rule. But here, here's the interesting fact. When we go into a school, and as students to solve the problems, predictably they don't do as well on the, on the blue problem, the abstract logic problem, than they do on the green problem. But when we give them the green problem first and, and the blue problem second, but in between we tell them, now that you're solving this problem, think about the problem you just solved. See if there's anything there that helps you with this one. Then the percentage of students who can solve the more difficult problem goes way up. And it's statistically significant, actually. The reason for that is that the knowledge needs to be activated in order to be useful. And that is the same for you, if you think about it. Uh, you all had the knowledge of drinking rules, if you are viewing this from the US. And it did not dawn on you that you can use that little tidbit in your brain out of the millions of things that are in your brain to help solve that abstract logic problem. So the moral of the story is that most of our knowledge sits there doing nothing most of the time and that we need to activate it before it can become useful. The good news is that the activation is one of the easy things to do. Just reminding students, like in that example, think of the problem you just solved. Think about the thing you learned in calculus. See how that can apply to this physics problem or this engineering situation. That's all that is needed for the activation, if the knowledge is indeed um, in the students' minds.